jaz bi vas rada še enkrat izredno pozdravila na konferenci v svojem imenu in pa v imenu soorganizatora Inštituta Nove revije. Lepo pozdravljam vse prisotne, vse podpornike in sodelavce pri projektu, vse predavatelje. Zaradi tu i gosto bom pa zdaj v nadaljevanju spregovorila v angliščini. So, as the lead of the project Tales of Age and in the name of co-organizer Institute Nova Revia, I am pleased to welcome you at the conference Tales of Age. Aging co-defines our contemporary world. We age, our beloved ones age, our society ages. Aging affects our abilities, needs and desires. And the project Tales of Age is based on conviction that the foundation for discussing, accepting and influencing the process of aging in all these different contexts is knowledge. When empowered by knowledge, different generations can understand each other and can jointly create a future society where aging is not considered a problem, but a challenge. But knowledge of aging has many different faces. It includes the biological understanding of aging, of how and why we age, the medical understanding of the consequences of aging for our health, the demographic understanding on how aging affects the structure of our society, the anthropological understanding of what aging means to us, and the philosophical understanding of what aging actually is, if I name just a few. The comprehensiveness and the existential depth of the topic of aging can often block the much needed intergenerational dialogue we all should be having. In the last years, the team behind Tales of Age led two projects in which we tried to present the many faces of aging, especially to our younger generation, through reading quality literature. Literature in many, sometimes subtle ways, mirrors our, our everyday, including these different faces of aging, and even codifies our perception of different everyday phenomena, such as aging. When reading fictional worlds quickly merge with the reader's personal experiences and open a debate on scientific as well as philosophical aspects of aging. When faced with symptoms of aging or age-related diseases, literature can help children to better understand and cope with the situation they're faced in real life. The positive experience and feedback from the project encourage us to proceed with the project Tales of Age. Its main agenda is to connect different aspects of aging and enable its comprehensible understanding and to connect experts in the many phases of aging with educators and reading mentors who, through their daily work with the young, really have an immense influence on how our future society will look like. I'm very pleased that we were able to gather some of the leading international experts from the fields of science, philosophy, arts, and education, who will, in the next days, help us to better understand what aging actually is. And I'm extremely pleased to welcome among us Dr. Thomas Kirkwood, Professor of Medicine and Associate Dean for Aging at Newcastle University, Professor of Biogerontology at the University of Copenhagen, a Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and a senior investigator of the UK National, National Institute for Health Research. Tom is one of the world's leading researchers in biology of aging. His research is focused on the basic science of aging and on understanding how genes as well as non-genetic factors influence longevity and health in old age. Among others, he essentially contributed to the inquiry into the evolution of aging by proposing the concept of disposable soma. Equally important, Tom is a remarkable communicator of his scientific work to the wider public and a tireless promoter of science. He's the author of several books, among them the award-winning Time of Our Lives, The Science of Human Aging, which is, in my opinion, one of the best popular science books discussing the topic of aging. So please, Tom, the stage is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Tina. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, um, and I would uh, strongly uh, endorse everything that Tina said uh, a moment ago. 
about the importance of looking at something as big as aging from many different viewpoints. It is one of the most important things that is happening on our planet at the moment is the fact that we are seeing this extraordinary increase in life expectancy, a change in the proportion of the population that are becoming older and that brings with it many exciting opportunities as well as many uh, important challenges. So as Tina has uh, kindly described to you, my background is a background in science, uh, but having worked on aging now for more than 40 years, uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed on that journey is the appreciation of how important it is to interconnect the knowledge that we're gaining from scientific studies with the knowledge that we're gaining from other approaches, from literature, from philosophy, from you know social structure, everything. It has to work together. Um, what I'm going to do in this talk, uh, I'm going to use a few slides because I think there are some images that may be helpful in trying to understand what we're learning about the scientific aspects of aging. Even if you're not a scientist, and I appreciate that many of you are not scientists, I hope you will still get from the, the talk some of the essence of the scientific thinking that is helping to inform our appreciation of aging. While I've been speaking, you may be wondering about the images on the right-hand side. I have no idea who the baby is. Uh, the lady at the bottom of the slide, at the bottom right-hand corner, is the current world record holder for human longevity. She died in 1997, uh, the French woman Jeanne Calmont, uh, and she reached the extraordinary age of 122 years and five months. So she represents the, the target. Uh, for all of us if we want to break uh, the world record. Now, what is aging? Um, one of the interesting challenges of this is that, of course, we all know what aging is. It's something we learn to appreciate really very early in childhood. I remember the development of my children, and usually quite young, three, four, five years of age, children begin to appreciate that there is something different about old people, about their grandparents, even these days about great-grandparents. Um, and as we grow up, we are so familiar with aging that we kind of just absorb ideas, we form conceptions about aging. It becomes a whole part of our kind of personal framework. But it is quite important to really look at this question, what is aging, from a number of different perspectives. And if we look at it from the perspective of science, there are many, many questions we could ask about it. I've listed here, I think it's 14 or 15 questions. How do we define aging? Does aging have to happen? Is it a biological necessity? Does it occur in all species of animals and even plants? Why does it occur? What is it that sets the length of life? How does aging affect our bodies, the molecules, the cells, the tissues? Is it inevitable that the reproductive system ages? We know that the reproductive system does age. Uh, we know, for example, particularly in women, about menopause, but reproduction ages in men also. But is it inevitable? Is aging normal or a disease? Uh, in medical science, this has been a question much debated. It's become almost a theological debate in some senses. It's very important. Why are aged cells and organs more vulnerable to disease? Another question, is longevity inherited within a species? We all have grown up with the idea that if you have long-lived parents and grandparents, it's more likely you will live a longer life yourself. Is it true? Where does it come from? Does the environment affect longevity? What particular mechanisms contribute to aging? How can we change them? And of course, the question that we have been excited by for really as long as human records exist, is it possible that we might one day live forever? Uh, the, the sort of the fantasy of immortality has come back to the front of people's attention now because particularly in Silicon Valley, there are billionaires who sort of believe that they have conquered everything and they think now maybe if they throw some of their billions at the problem of aging, they could live forever. <laughs> is, this, is this a delusion? Now, if I was to try to speak to each of these questions, I would have about two minutes per question. So 
So clearly that's unrealistic in a talk of reasonable length. So I'm going to just address a few questions as I go through this. Uh, and uh, if you have other questions afterwards, maybe in discussion we can, uh, we can pick up on them. Now, the one thing about ageing that many of us take almost to define the act <coughs> of ageing is maybe the one thing that also makes ageing a subject of fear for all of us. And the sad but essential truth is that it is ageing that limits the length of our lives. If we follow, and this is the continuous curve, the, the one that starts at 100 on the left, how ageing affects the survivorship of a population of people, we can see that we all have a pretty good chance to remain alive through to age 30, 40, 50, but then the survival curve begins to go down and it reaches sort of zero, well, we know 122 is the record, more and more people are reaching 100, but you know there are not many people who make it to 110, so somewhere around 110, 120, uh, is what the point where you know, we are extremely unlikely still to be alive. <clears throat> and what is driving this is shown in the dashed curve, which is the way that your risk of dying increases with age. And of course, this is quite a frightening concept. We deal with it in all, all kinds of ways. We very often practice a kind of denial about it, but it is an underlying reality. We know it's there. It won't go away if we refuse to look at it. We should confront it. We should try to understand it. We should try to build it into our own personal concept of the significance <coughs> of our life on this planet. We also know, and this is really very interesting, that if we look at the animal world around us, that we have this extraordinary phenomenon of having animal species that have many different lifespans. So I've picked a few here, uh, and uh, I've put some numbers on them. In the middle, there are very short-lived animals, nematode worms that live for about three weeks. Uh, they're a great subject for study and research on aging because you can conduct experiments very quickly. Uh, a lot of work is done on mice in the bottom left corner. They have a lifespan of three years. Longer to study, but still feasible within the lifetime, for example, of a doctoral student's project or a research project. Then you get longer-lived animals. Next to the mouse is the cat. Uh, cats can live nearly 30 years. Then we have in the bottom right-hand corner, we have bats. Bats are surprisingly long-lived. This is quite a short-lived short species of bat I have here. Uh, but bats can live some species up into 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, we have uh, then in the middle at the bottom, we have giant tortoises. Uh, we know these can live hundreds of years. There are individual specimens that have been observed to be alive for more than 200 years. And recently, a species that's come to be of study is in the top left corner. This is a rather ugly looking animal. It's called the naked mole rat. Uh, it's a colonial animal, a little bit like the honeybees that are under them. They have a queen. They live underground, so they're not much seen. Uh, and they have lifespans that have surprised people because they can certainly live longer than 30 years. Very interesting biology. I just mentioned bees. Bees are interesting because you have the queens who are very long-lived. They can live 10 years or more. But you have the worker bees also genetically you know, the same organism, but they have lifespans of just about three months. And then over on the right-hand side, we have some plants that are very long-lived. This is a photograph I took four years ago in Namibia. It's of one of the longest living plants on the planet. Uh, this is a plant called Welwitchia, and there are individual specimens of this plant that are known to be more than 2,000 years old. Finally, in the top right-hand corner is uh, a very small animal. Uh, it's the hydra, the freshwater hydra. You may have encountered them in school biology. Sometimes they're studied. Very interesting organism. And this has been studied intensively in ageing research over the last 20 years because as far as we know, hydra do not age at all. Uh, individual organisms seem to have the capacity to live without deteriorating, without losing the capacity for reproduction. So in the previous slide I showed you how ageing affects the survival prospects of people. If I showed you a similar slide for hydra, they would just, they can't die, they can die of accidental deaths but the rate of dying would not show that steep increase. It would remain constant across time. 
And that's very interesting when we ask deep biological questions about what is aging. So the first of the questions I want to spend a little bit of time on is the question, why does aging occur at all? Uh, this is a question that started to interest me when I was at the very beginning of my scientific career. And it's a question that, uh, you know, sort of, we are reminded, this is a remark made uh, back in the 1970s uh, by one of the great geneticists of the 20th century, Theodosius Dobzhansky, who said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So, you know, we need to ask, aging exists in humans, it exists in so many other animal species as I've shown, but it doesn't exist in all of them. So we have to try to understand these things from the perspective of the theory of evolution through natural selection. So why should aging occur? Well, if you haven't encountered or thought about this question before, what I find is that 9 out of 10, maybe even more, 19 out of 20 people, when asked to think about this question for the first time, think a little bit and say, well, of course, aging has to happen, because if we didn't have an aging process, the world would be overcrowded with people and animals that didn't have the good grace to lie down and die and make way for the next generation. So it's suggested that aging is a very important biological process because it prevents species from overcrowding their environments. And then people who maybe have had the opportunity to appreciate a little bit more how natural selection works say, but of course aging is also needed because it limits the lifetime of a generation and that means that evolution is continuing to throw up novelty. So aging provides the means for natural selection to help species adapt to changes in their environment. Now these ideas lead to the idea that we have evolved some genetic program to make us age. Specifically that within our genomes is something that programs us to live for a certain period of time and then to die. And the reason is that somehow, although it feels bad for us as individuals, somehow aging is good for the species. Now, as I say, this is a popular idea, and even within the realm of science, uh, you find that there are many, many people who implicitly assume that aging exists for a positive reason and that it is driven by some kind of program. But actually, as scientific ideas go, this is as wrong as you can possibly be. Uh, and it turns out uh, that there are many, many reasons why aging cannot be programmed. Probably the most powerful of these is that if you look at the natural world, it doesn't happen. You just don't see aging doing this, because in the natural world, animals die young. They die because the world is a dangerous place. Uh, they die from accidents, they die from starvation, they die from cold, they die from infections, they die from many, many reasons. But field biologists have gone out and studied animals in the wild. For example, mice. If you look at wild <coughs> populations of mice, 95% of mice in the wild are dead before their first birthday. And there are very, very few individual mice that will live beyond 15 or 18 months. Now, aging in wild mice doesn't really happen until beyond 18 months. So what we're <coughs> saying is this is a process that nature hardly ever sees. So how could it be programmed? You can't program something that never occurs. You can't program something that isn't needed. And also, when we look more closely at how evolution by natural selection works, it is really hard to argue that something which is so bad for the individual could be favoured by natural selection, because we're beginning to learn that natural selection just doesn't work that way. So we have to get rid right at the outset from the idea that ageing happens because of a genetic program that works within our bodies to kill us. And this is a really important step in addressing what is aging, but also in appreciating you know, what is happening with aging and what the future may hold. So if it's not programmed for some positive reason, why does aging happen? Remember, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this is a question that I started to sort of think about long, long ago. And the answer comes from putting together a couple of principles from biology. One is, you know, what is an organism? An organism, if we think about it in the kind of abstract sense, it's, a, it's an entity. It is something 
that during its lifetime acquires resources, acquires energy. All organisms must take in energy. They take it in chiefly through the foods that they eat. And what do they do with that energy? They use it to grow. They use it to maintain the body. They maybe store some because you can never be sure when the next meal is coming from, so we lay some down as fat. And they have to reproduce. And reproducing is costly. So what the organism has to do is to manage its energy budget just in the same way that each one of us has to do, has to manage our financial budget. So you have a bank account. Into your bank account goes money. Out of your bank account goes what you spend. There's a principle we learn very early with banking, and that is that you can't spend the same money twice. And it's the same with organisms. You can't spend the same energy twice. So you face tough choices. Do you fix your car or do you go on a holiday, for example? These are the kinds of choices that we have to face. For organisms, it's how much do we invest in one activity versus how much do we invest in another? So keep that idea in mind because it's actually central to answering the question, what is aging and why does aging occur? The other idea that I want to bring into the mix is an idea that comes from the great German naturalist August Weissmann who did most of his work in the 19th century. He actually lived through to 1914. And Weissmann made one tremendously important observation, among many other interesting and important things he did in life. But he recognized that in the bodies of a multicellular organism like you or me or a mouse or a tortoise, the cells that make up the body belong to two very different categories. There is a category that he termed the germline, and these are the cells of the reproductive lineage. These are the cells that form the gonads, the testes, the ovaries, in which the gametes, what are called the gametes, the reproductive cells, the sperm and the egg are formed that will create the next generation. And what Weissmann appreciated is that the germline, in a sense, has to be immortal. And this is such an important concept. It's actually quite an incredible thought to ask yourself, here you are in this room this morning. You came into the room, your body came in, you brought your body in. You, know, so you can ask how that process works. But your body is here. Your body contains approximately 100 million million cells. Now, where do those cells come from? Well, we know that you began your life as a single cell, the fertilized egg that came from two cells, one from each of your parents. Where did those cells come from? Well, you run the process back a generation. They came from the cell that started your parents' life. They came from the cells that you know, your, started your grandparents' life. Go back. Every single cell in the, you, the room today, in your body, could, if the records existed, could trace its presence here now, in September 2018, through an unbroken chain of cell division that goes back four billion years to the formation of the earliest life on this planet. So you are quite incredible and you are touched with immortality because your cells are as near to immortal as they could be. And if you have kids, that lineage will continue into the future. But the sad news is that you're going to die. <laughs> we're all going to die and we're going to die because the rest of our body, what Weissman termed the soma, is mortal. So there is this fundamental difference. And it was this, back uh, in February 1977, I was pondering this question in my bath back in London, and I hit upon a realization, and it combines what I've just told you. In nature, animals do not live very long unless you protect them. And they face tough choices about how much they invest in maintaining the body versus how much they will invest in producing the children for the next generation and growing. And now ask yourself, in those circumstances, if you were designing the genome, how much would you invest in the day-to-day -day maintenance and repair of the body? And the answer is, you only should invest enough to keep the body in good shape for as long as it has a reasonable chance still to be alive. So think of the mice. I told you you know, mice very rarely might live to 15 months, almost never beyond 18 months. What does a mouse therefore need for the maintenance of its body? 
It needs good enough maintenance that the body will not become seriously damaged before about 15 or 18 months of age. That's what a mouse has. You don't see much aging until 15, 18 months. After that, the mouse begins to show signs of aging, just like a human being at another age. For humans, what do we need for our bodies? Well, we live longer than mice. And that's an interesting question. I don't have to go t time to go into it. What do we need? We need a body that keeps itself in good shape, perhaps through 30 years, maybe 40 years. Beyond that, doesn't terribly much matter. That's what we have. We have bodies in which our maintenance process keeps us in good shape for the period of time that we would have needed in our ancestral past. And this is an idea which says that effectively our genomes treat the body, the soma, as disposable. And this is a concept that helps us to understand what is aging, why aging occurs, and quite a lot, as we'll see, about what is the nature of the aging process. So the important consequence is this, there's no program that actively drives the aging process. Aging results from an accumulation of damage, how long we live, how long a species lives, is regulated by how natural selection has evolved the capacity to resist stress and to repair damage. And also something that's very important for those of us who work on the biology of aging is that there's no single mechanism of aging, but there are lots and lots of maintenance and repair systems, so aging has multiple causes. So I want to talk for a little bit because it just helps us to understand the challenges of aging in today's world, you know, how aging is actually caused. And this is, gets a little bit biological, but I will be quite quick going through this, but I want to leave you with the flavor of what we are learning about this. So the aging process, as I said, is not programmed, it's driven by damage. The damage leads in time to an accumulation of defects in the cells and tissues of our bodies. And in time, in a human being, this takes some decades to happen, we see what we can call the functional impairments in the organs and tissues when we actually notice that things are not working as well as they did when we were young. And that leads in time to age-related frailty, to disability, to disease. Aging is a process, you can ask, you know, when does aging begin? Uh, and you get a variety of answers. People might say aging begins at 40 or 50 or 60. Actually, what you usually find if you ask people of different ages, you say, when does, you know, when does the person begin to become old? The answer is almost always, take the age of the person you've asked, add 15 years, and that's the answer they will give you. So you ask a teenager when aging begins, and they will say 30. Yeah, ask an 85-year-old when aging begins, they will say 100. Uh, and it's sort of a moving horizon. But the reality is that aging begins very early, you know, not quite from the moment of uh, conception, but soon after that, when the germline and the soma begin to separate in their destinies in the developing embryo. And the damage that will lead to our aging has built up, started to build up, even before we are born. So it's a cumulative, slow, progressive process. And it's actually quite important that we understand that, because we each of us have some responsibility for the trajectory that we follow through life, the journey we make into aging. And you know, it's all about maintenance and repair. Um, if you have a car and you want to keep it going, you look after it. You, know, you take it regularly for servicing. You change the oil. You keep it clean. You do all the things that are necessary for that car to continue operating in good functional order. We have to begin to appreciate how important this is for the aging of the body. We can visualize, we can actually, with the power of modern science, we can see the damage that is happening. This is a single cell, an old cell. And we can use amazing microscopic techniques to see damage in the cell. The dark oval in the middle of this cell is the nucleus, where the DNA is. And the little speckly dots, I won't go into the detail, but we can actually visualize individual instances of damage to the DNA in the nucleus. The rest, you know, it's a little bit shape of a kind of fried egg. You've got the yolk, the nucleus in the middle, and then the, the white of the egg around is what's called the cytoplasm. And the fluorescent staining in this slide is showing the state of the all-important mitochondria in the cytoplasm. These are the little elements within the cell that provides the energy that we depend on for everything that we do. And in order to appreciate the status of this old cell, 
All you need to know is that green is bad and red is good. And you can see that most of the mitochondria are damaged. So you know, as we get older, if we try to hurry for the bus and we find that we can't do it as we did when we were young, there's an explanation because the energy forming organelles in our muscle cells may look like this and we just can't do it. If you meet someone, someone you know but you haven't seen them for a while and you can't bring their name immediately to mind and you know sort of I'm old enough but well, actually I've always had this problem but I have it much more now. The reason is that the brain is an energy hungry organ. It will come. It'll probably come 20 minutes after they've walked past you on the street. Uh, it's because the energy you need to retrieve that memory is not as available to your brain cells as it was when you were younger. So this is part of the biology of aging. Species live different lifespans. This is just from a PhD student who worked with me some 20 odd years ago. We took cells from mammals having different lifespans. They were things like rabbits and mice and sheep and cows and human beings. We measured how good the cells were at maintaining and repairing themselves to different kinds of damage. And the graphs show the relationship between how good the cell was at re repairing that specific kind of damage, that's on the vertical scale, and on the horizontal scale, how long the species lived in terms of the years of its lifespan. Longer lived species invest in more maintenance and repair. So there's an important message that this is something that natural selection has worked on. And maybe we can work on in the future. Sorry, I went the wrong way. So, you know, science is getting quite exciting. When I started in this, people thought I was crazy to be working on aging. Aging was not a sexy subject at all. It was not of interest. It's now become one of the hot areas of biology. And now people talk about the diverse hallmarks of aging. And I'm not going to go into the detail of this. There are lots of things that change with aging. I told you it's complex. There are multiple mechanisms. So the field is moving forward very fast in terms of understanding this. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what is happening to human aging and longevity today, because this is one of the most extraordinary things that has become apparent over the last 20, 30 or so years. What we know is that life expectancy has been increasing, initially in the high income countries of the world, then in the middle income countries of the world, and now currently increasing very rapidly in the low income countries of the world. This is a graph that shows, you know, through the rear view mirror, the history of the increase in life expectancy that's occurred over most of the last 200 years. Each individual dot here, the writing is very small, you won't be able to read it, but each individual dot for the year in question, it shows the, the year, the calendar year across the bottom, shows what in that year, was the life expectancy in the country in that year that had the highest longevity in the world, the highest life expectancy. So it's a graph, if you like, of the leaders of the pack. And you can see that it's astonishingly linear, that life expectancy has been going up as a kind of real straight line over this history. The identity of the longest living country has changed around a bit, you know, sort of started off in Scandinavia. Then it moved down to the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand. Over the last while, it's been Japan that is consistently the longest lived country in the world. Actually, with one tiny exception, Monaco is longer lived than Japan, but Monaco is so small that it never normally features in the tables. But this extraordinary pattern is happening. Now, what's very interesting is that if you go back to 1980, the United Nations that monitors these things and was making forecasts said that they expected that in spite of the fact that life expectancy had been increasing so steadily for 200 years, they predicted that the rate of increase would come almost to a halt almost immediately. You can see from the graph that humanity completely ignored the United Nations, <laughs> carried on increasing its life expectancy regardless. So the UN in 1990 came up with a sort of compromise forecast and in 2000 came up with a forecast which accepted the kind of the reality. So what you see in this graph is the waking up of a major international organization to something that was completely unforeseen. No one expected what has seen, been seen in the last few decades, which is the continuing increase in life expectancy. And the reason for that is that the increase in life expectancy to that point 
had been driven by one thing only, and that was our improving success in reducing the deaths in the early and middle years of life. So the increase in life expectancy, which remember is an average in the population, was being influenced by what was happening to children. And we got better and better and better at preventing deaths in children and young adults. You know, we know the story. It was clean drinking water. It was better housing. Then it was vaccines against the killing diseases. And in the middle of the 20th century, it was antibiotics. So what had happened by the time we got through to 1980 was that we had almost completed the task. We had reduced the deaths in the early and middle years of life in rich countries to such a low level that if we could eradicate them all, we would see very little further increase in life expectancy. And that is why the United Nations and everyone else predicted that life expectancy would hit a ceiling. Now, the extraordinary thing that has become apparent is that something completely new is driving the current increase in life expectancy. And this is that people are reaching old age in better and better health than they did in previous generations. So the only thing that is driving the increase in life expectancy now is that the death rates of very old people are falling and falling and falling. And this is challenging. It's exciting. It creates a lot of issues for countries managing things like pension schemes. It creates issues for each and every one of us because we have to keep adjusting our expectations of what will our old age will be like, how long we will live. It's affecting medicine too, because in the traditional model of medicine, age-related diseases, conditions like Alzheimer's disease, conditions like osteoporosis, were regarded as just a disease. And you have in all of these diseases, you have what you call the end-stage pathology. It's what shows up when a person has advanced quite a long way in the progression of this disease. But gradually now, in order to understand a disease, you need to work upstream from the end stage pathology and ask, how did you get there? And it's beginning to be seen that as you work up from the end stage pathology of one age-related disease, or another age-related disease, I've just called them ABC, <coughs> you find yourself encountering the same mechanisms. And they're all about damage. They're all about molecular and cellular damage. And what we're beginning to learn is that they're all the mechanisms of damage that contribute to aging. So there is a massive overlap in the pathways that lead to all these different age-related diseases and the pathways that are a part of the normal process of aging. So the big revolution that is just beginning to occur in the medical sciences but still has a long, long way to unfold is an appreciation of what it is about intrinsic aging that makes us more vulnerable to disease. People working on diseases try to find what they call risk factors. And if you look at the literature in medical sciences, the risk factors for diseases like cancer, for diseases like dementia, the things people publish are things like genetic factors, things like lifestyle factors, things like smoking, things like diet. They're all important. They do make a contribution to the disease. But if you draw a graph on which you show the magnitude of those risk factors and you compare them to aging, those risk factors are down here. Aging is way up there. And it's really time that we began to re-engineer our thinking about disease to take this into account. So what we're learning, I told you earlier that aging was caused by random molecular damage leading to cellular defects, leading to frailty, disability, disease. That's absolutely true. But what we're learning now, which is so important, is that this doesn't just happen in biological isolation. It happens in bodies of people who are living in society. And so things like stress, things like living in a bad environment, things like having poor nutrition, actually accelerate the aging process because they contribute some of the damage that is part of what will ultimately make us become ill and die. And on the other side of the coin, we're learning that healthy lifestyle, healthy nutrition, actually empower the body's cellular maintenance and repair systems so we can live longer, better for longer. So what we're learning is that aging is malleable, and it's this malleability that explains this unforeseen 
continuing increase in life expectancy. In Newcastle, where I've been working for the last 20 years, we started a study back in 2006, the Newcastle 85 Plus study, which had a very simple design. We approached everyone, starting in 2006, everyone in the city who had been born in 1921. So this was the year of their 85th birthday. Old people had been largely ignored in medical studies before then. It was assumed, you know, they were kind of not interesting or that they would be too hard to work with because a lot of them would be demented and everything. Well, it isn't the case. And I'm not going to go into any of the detail of this. The time isn't available. But we were able to perform the largest and most detailed investigation of what life was actually like for people at age 85 and beyond. We've been following them. We're still following them. Uh, they had their 95th birthday in 2016. And some of them are still alive, and we still get data from them. One of the things, uh, and the data, this is just, these are just photographs, is some of the research nurses on the project interacting with subjects in the Newcastle 85 Plus study. One of the things we found is that the conventional wisdom about illness and old age is right. We were able in our investigations to determine for each person in the study whether they had or did not have any of 18 different age-related diseases, and for each of them, they would get a number, which might be two if they had two illnesses or seven if they had seven age-related illnesses. And the graph shows in different colors for men and women. Men are blue, women are the, the sort of purpley color here. The number of diseases. <clears throat> and what we found was that nobody in uh, more than a 1,000 in, in the study had nothing wrong with them at age 85. And three quarters of them had four or more illnesses. So it was very normal to be in a state of what's called multi-morbidity, to have multiple illnesses at the same time. And that fits with the kind of the conventional wisdom. Old age is a time when people fall sick a lot. But what we hadn't expected, we asked them to self-rate their health and quality of life. And we found that 78% of them, that's nearly four out of every five, self-rated their health and quality of life as being good, very good, or excellent. So in spite of all these illnesses, very old people were mostly able to enjoy a pretty good quality of life. Not all of them, of course. Some of them were having a truly miserable time, but the general answer was that the quality of life was good. Now, something that uh, we've been looking at and something that is really important across the world is that we're learning that in terms of healthy life expectancy, <clears throat> there is a really important impact of how your life is lived, and in particular, your socioeconomic status. So Newcastle has a metro system. Uh, and Some of my colleagues simply took a fraction of the metro map uh, from Newcastle and put numbers on it showing the age of expected onset of the first age-related long-term condition for a person who is 55 years old already. You could produce a similar map for any big city in the world today. If you get on at the rich end of the line, uh, that's at the top left corner, then your age of expected onset is nearly 75 years. But if you sit on the train for half an hour to the bottom right corner, you come to an area of high deprivation. And during that half hour journey, you lose 11 years of healthy life expectancy. In London, it said if you get on the Jubilee line at Westminster Station, and you ride it southwards, you lose a year of life expectancy for every station you pass. I don't know how things are in Ljubljana, but I would expect that there is a social gradient in healthy living here as well. Certainly every city that I've visited around the world has this issue. So um, I want to bring things to a close, um, and I just want to make a few remarks. Firstly, to say, you know, I've talked primarily about the science, but it is really important to recognize that with this unforeseen revolution in life expectancy, almost everything is changing. We're having to rethink health and health care. We're having to rethink social care. We should be rethinking education because the world is changing fast. And we all grew up in a system where education is piled into children and young adults. And then you're expected to go through life without updating your skill set. Work is changing. Leisure is changing. Retirement is changing. The way we organize our finance, pensions is changing. Family structures are changing for all kinds of reasons. You know, we no longer have traditional families. We have many more you know, permutations, combinations. But within families, we have a lot more older people. 
which is why a project like Tales of Age that engages with people across the life course is so important. Communities are changing. Transport and travel are changing. I came on the EasyJet flight from London yesterday, and it was very interesting. You know, you fly anywhere these days, you see this impact of the, you know, the longevity revolution in the people who are traveling, the age spectrum of people taking public transport. Completely different now from what it used to be. Communications are changing, housing is changing, end of life management, and what we expect at the end of life are changing. So there's a lot that we need to deal with. Uh, and as Tina mentioned, uh, you know, in recent years I've become involved a lot with government in the UK trying to address ways of sort of changing uh, things to uh, recognize uh, what is happening with the age structure of population. But there are powerful barriers to getting the answers right. First of all, it's fatalism. People think, oh, yeah, just, it's just going to happen. Nothing you can do about it. There's a lot of prejudice. A lot of the prejudice is implicit, but there's a huge amount of ageism. Even though we talk about it more, recognize it more, it's deep and deeply ingrained. There's a reluctance, particularly a reluctance among politicians to address complex challenges, which leads to a narrowness of vision. And again, in a political climate where you have elections coming along every four or five years, there's a short-termism which is imposed on people. There's a shortage of money. We all know it's 10 years since uh, the economic disasters of September 2008. We know we're still dealing with the repercussions of that, but it doesn't necessarily take a lot of money to find the necessary solutions. Can lifespan be extended further? I'm really not going to speak very much about this. I just want to make a few remarks. Uh, the Fountain of Youth. This is a painting by uh, one, a great painter of an earlier century, Lucas Cranach. Uh, it shows, it's a rather nice depiction of the Fountain of Youth. You may know it. It hangs in a museum in Berlin. It's a rather sexist Fountain of Youth because it's rejuvenating only women and the old women are being brought to the fountain on the left-hand side, some of them in wheelbarrows, they're all decrepit. They go into the fountain, they bathe for a while, and they emerge rejuvenated on the right-hand side where the young men are waiting to embrace them. It's, it's a strange and rather disturbing picture. But, you know, sort of I mentioned Silicon Valley and the obsession of some of the billionaires there. Um, there is excitement about anti-aging interventions. Uh, people talk about dietary restriction, people talk about fasting strategies, exercise, stuff about drugs. This gets into the everyday press, so I'm sure you've read newspaper articles about some of this. There's the idea that if you transfer blood from young to old individuals, this has been experiments done in mice and rats, it seems to have rejuvenated properties. There are companies now getting serum and plasma from young humans and going to be offering them to old people. These are ideas that have been around actually for a long time. And there's something which is called senolysis, targeted deletion of the most seriously aged cells. I'm not going to talk about that science at the moment, other than to say that there are major challenges. What people want to do is to prolong the health span, so to allow people to live longer, healthier, for better. But there are huge challenges in doing this. The, the industry, the world of science would have you believe that within five to ten years all of these new therapies will be available to us. But there's so much we need to do. We need better ways of measuring aging. It's a science that's still in its infancy. We need to understand its complexity. We need to recognize if you want to prove these things work uh, in humans, that's a process that will take decades. The research is done in short-lived animal models like nematode worms and mice. Uh, and translating that across to humans is a challenge. There are going to be side effects. Aging is the result of side effects, compromises, trade-offs. So these things will not necessarily be entirely good for us, and we will face choices of whether we choose to take a therapy that we might start when we're young, in our 30s, 20s even, in order maybe to make us live a little bit longer, but they will harm us in some kind of way. There are people who practice dietary restriction on themselves, uh, uh, it's a very unpleasant business to reduce your food intake to those low levels. You're hungry all the time, you shiver, you can't keep warm, you have great difficulty sitting down because you have no flesh on your bottom, so you have to take a cushion with you everywhere. <laughs> and it completely destroys your libido, your sex drive. So you may end up living a little bit longer, but it's going to be pretty miserable along the way. <laughs> 
So I want to close with this slide. There's a traditional view of aging, and this permeates all that I appreciate, which is that the body is programmed to age and die through a fixed aging process. That aging is all bad news, it's progressive, irreversible loss of functional capacity and quality of life. That aging is something that only concerns old people. And that increasing human longevity is this ticking demographic time bomb that threatens to impose an intolerable burden on societies around the world. And I would suggest that these, which are not scientific attitudes so much, partially scientific attitudes, but they are partly ingrained in our personal and social thinking of aging, we can, on the basis of what we're learning about the science, we can tear up the traditional view and replace it with a new view of age, which is the body is programmed for survival. Just not programmed well enough to last indefinitely. But when we try to live longer for better, we're working with the grain of our biology and not against it. Aging is malleable. Youth and age are a continuum. And increasing longevity, doubling the average length of human life over the course of the last 200 years, is surely one of humanity's greatest successes. And if the ingenuity of our predecessors was such that made this possible, then we need to use a little bit of that same cleverness to make a success for the fact that we're all living so much longer. So I will close at that point. Thank you very much, Dina, for the invitation. <coughs> Much, Tom. Are there any questions for Professor Kirkwood? The quality of life, you said, yeah. among the people uh, after 85, yeah. what they expressed was good. Uh, the same we witness here in Slovenia among the students of Third Age University. They say this is our nicest uh, and best period of life, yeah. with a lot of freedoms, creativity, self-expression, self-realization, and so on. Yeah. I, I, I think that's absolutely true. The one thing <coughs> that I would say is that uh, old people are very diverse, <coughs> um, and uh, we need people are diverse at all ages. <coughs> Children are diverse. Young adults are diverse, uh, and we, we, as we, as we sort of, you know, uh, can go further in the journey of a society with more older people. The same thing we see in the UK, the University of the Third Age. The people who take advantage of that are the people who have usually had the benefit of uh, better education, <clears throat> and usually the ones who come to the activities are the ones who are enjoying the better help. So we need to remember, and this is where the social gradient is important, <clears throat> that there are quite a lot of people who are reaching old age who do not have the advantages of education to make the same success of it and to enjoy the same quality of life. So I, I, I'm totally with you uh, that you know, sort of many, many old people are actually finding that old age is a time of great freedom and liberation and opportunity. Uh, but actually, we also need to be mindful of the people for whom that is, is not the case. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, but I, I welcome your, your comment. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for an excellent overview of a scientist. I wonder if I understand correctly, there are actually two groups of, uh, or, or two views uh, on uh, uh, possible mortality or immortality yeah. or uh, the longevity of a human being. One would say if medically is everything right, if we can fix genes, yeah. if we can put the bionic chips all over, we, c we could actually live forever or at least thousands and thousands of years. Uh, whereas some other studies recently would put a cap there around, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Jean Calmont's age, uh, if you want, so around uh, 122, 125, uh, uh, and would say, no, it's not possible. What would be the view of your group? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, in a, way, in a way, those are two slightly different questions. One is, there, there has been quite a lot of scientific discussion about whether there is a, a limit to the human lifespan. 
in, you know, in lives that are being currently lived. The other question is, would it be possible for science to alter that aging process uh, to make longer lifespans possible? So the, the, the first question, there, there was a paper published in Nature two years ago uh, which claimed that there was evidence, statistical evidence for an upper limit to human lifespan. It was a really bad paper. <laughs> Uh, bad papers do get published in top quality journals and it made fundamental statistical errors um, and it attracted an unprecedented number of published criticisms of the study. Um, so it's a bit, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to the ceiling of lifespan. But it, lifespan, the, the limit for longevity is a little bit like the world record for the 1500 meters. You know, so when you've had more and more people trying to break the record it becomes increasingly difficult to break it again and to break it again and break it again so you know i think if one looks at it realistically we're not going to see the world record being for longevity being broken by large amounts soon although you know if you think of the world record for the 100 meters we have occasionally an athlete like usain bolt who kind of comes along and makes a big shift in the limit so it kind of could happen, but there's no reason in what we understand of the biology of aging to think that there exists a hard limit or that we are necessarily anywhere near the limit. So the answer to that question is it won't happen by big increments, but it will almost surely happen. That's my view. Um, uh, it's, you know, but as you say, you know, it's, it's a subject of discussion. As to what might happen in the future, fundamentally, Aging is driven by damage, so if science were able to find effective, realistic ways that did not impose too serious a trade-off uh, that could slow the accumulation of damage, then it should, at least in theory, be possible to extend the biological length of human life. And it's theoretically possible. But I think when you analyse the practical difficulties given our current state of knowledge in achieving that outcome, my estimate for the future is that it will take a very long time indeed before that happens. You know, bionic devices, nanoengineering, people talk about these. But then people talk about, you have futurists who like to get excited about the latest technologies. Genetic engineering, we have, you know, the... The, the great ability to alter genomes, which would be fine if we knew what we wanted to change. But we don't actually know what are the genes that influence longevity. You know, the, the CRISPR, you know, sort of DNA technologies may, in the not too distant future, allow us to cure genetic disorders where we know, like muscular dystrophy, where we know the genes that are broken. And it's just a simple engineering job to fix something that's broken but to redesign and re-engineer human biology in the way that some of these fantasies suggest is a completely different story altogether. In the, in the book that Tina kindly referred to, that uh, there's a copy on the table that I wrote some years ago called Time of Our Lives, I, I had finished the book, I had packaged it up to send to my publisher and I missed the post on a Friday. So when I got out of bed on the Saturday morning, I thought, hey, wait a minute, I've had an idea for a fictional epilogue, a work of fiction. So I wrote a, a short story about my projection of when it might become feasible and how it might become feasible to, to do that. So that story called Miranda's Tale is as an epilogue in that. And if you read it, you will see that I would probably be counted as a pessimist by the Silicon Valley people because I don't see it happening for some thousands of years. <laughs>